Hi, this is Laura Lee Griffin. And this is Nikki May with the Stardust Society, inspiring you to stop getting in your own way and start building an art biz and life that you love. We are artists who believe strongly in the power of community, accountability, following your intuition, taking small, actionable steps, and breaking down the barriers of fear and procrastination that keep you stuck. Follow along with us on our creative business journey as we encourage you on yours. Danielle Harris helps creatives prioritize marketing so they can share their gifts with the world. Helping creative entrepreneurs focus on the marketing strategies and tactics that will give them ethical and sustainable growth in their business is her goal. In addition to her 10 years of experience, Danielle has a BA in marketing a Master of Science in Marketing, and an MBA. If she's not qualified to talk to us about marketing, I don't know who is. <laughs> <laughs> Danielle, welcome to the Stardust Society. We are so happy to have you here. I am so glad to be here. Thank you guys for having me. You know, we like to start out our interviews by getting to hear your Stardust story. So I know that some people find their way to marketing after something else, but looking at your education, you've clearly always been interested in it. So how did you develop that interest? So here's the thing. I, I did study that in college and in you know, grad school and all, but I actually, when I was leaving and graduating from high school, I thought that I was going to be a doctor and oh. I went in and I studied biomedical medicine, uh -huh. uh, sort of biomedical engineering, and then like biomedical science in general. And then I was taking all the classes. And then I realized, no, I just actually liked Grey's Anatomy a lot. <laughs> that was that, that was the thing. And I was like, ah, I'm good at this. I'm fine at it. I love the sciences. But that was not it was not going to be my thing. Right. So uh, what I had always thought, it was like, oh, well, I'm going to be a doctor. So I'm going to like have a practice. So I'm going to take some business classes. So I know how to run my practice on my own. So that was always kind of a part of it. And when I was taking my first marketing class, it was just like this beautiful puzzle of like, oh, so here's the scenario. You have this product over here and you need to market it to these people. How do you package that all together? And it was just... It was so interesting to me. I was just like, ooh, so these people like this. So I should market this on this area over here and I should do these types of things over there. And it was just like this great puzzle that I wanted to know how to figure out. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, I think I like this. And so once I realized like, okay, I don't want to be a doctor, maybe I should do this marketing thing. So that was like kind of early-ish in my college career. And I just, I loved it ever since. And I incorporated in some more artistic type classes. So I did video editing because I was like, oh, well, yeah, I did like the Grey's Anatomy. Maybe it was like, I <laughs> wanted to like do the producing or like some type of aspect, video editing type thing. So I took video editing things, which all mixed in very well with the marketing background. And I just, I loved it ever since. It was just a great puzzle of trying to figure out people need or want something. Um, and how do I let them know that yeah. these are the things that can help them out. Um, because there are a lot of people that always have the, you know, the thought that, oh, marketing is yucky. Like it's gross. It's very manipulative. Mm -hmm. But that's not necessarily the case. It's really just presenting your best foot forward about how you can help serve the needs of other people or make people realize like you didn't even realize that this was a need that you had. Mm -hmm. I can solve this problem you didn't even recognize. Um, and so that was something that I just really very much loved about marketing. And so you know, over the past years and my story of going through um, some not sexy type groups, I, I worked in uh, concrete, the concrete industry for, you know, 10 years uh -huh. where I was helping uh, structural engineers market uh, concrete in codes and standards. So basically buildings don't fall down, which is, you know, very important. Oh, that sounds um, terribly exciting to market, though. <laughs> but, you know, it's like it's completely, to me, completely unsexy. Um, yeah. So when I 
I decided to focus on my own business, I realized like I wanted to work with creative people. I wanted to work with people that like really had a passion Mm -hmm. um, for what they were doing, creating, making. Um, And that just really lit me up. And so that's when I pivoted within the past couple of years of really focusing on on those individuals in particular. And I just have to say, I just really love that. I love helping people figure out like their little puzzle, like I said before, of like figuring out, okay, here's what you do and here are the different avenues that you have. How can we put that together in a way that makes sense so we can share your gift with the world? Yeah, and get it in front of the right people. Um, Because I I get that whole thing that sometimes as artists and creatives, we feel a little bit like it's slimy, like the word marketing has this I don't know, this weird context around it. Used car salesman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, exactly. Yep. Or in my case, used bus salesman. <laughs> <laughs> but then like realizing that that it doesn't have to be that way and that really you're you're putting things in front of people when you get that right audience that they want to hear or that they, they want to see. Um, but getting from A to Z is really confusing for a lot of us. So I'm excited to hear more about that from you today because I, I know it's it's information that we can all use. And we'll definitely jump into more detail about that, all that stuff in a second. But I just want to hear a little bit more about your story and how you went from concrete to what you're doing now. Did you start taking some clients on the side or did you just quit and dive head first? A little bit of both. Okay. <laughs> so specifically, specifically how I started out, um, maybe about two or so years ago, maybe this would be about 2018, 2019, I started thinking, how exactly can I fill this creative void that I was personally having? Mm-hmm. And so I, I just started to take on clients. I had always been the person that that people said like, oh, she might be able to help you with X, Y, and Z. And so I was like, well, maybe I'll fully lean into that and maybe start charging people money for for doing that. So I was helping people with their social media strategy. That was something that I'd done regularly through my nine to five. I helped a podcast festival get up and going. So I did their marketing for, for that type of event. And then it wasn't until mid 2021 where I was just like okay I think I'm ready and I officially made that jump and transition over after I had taken on clients off and on for you know the past year and a half or so Mm -hmm. and now now I'm loving it I'm loving helping out uh people in all all types of industries some I've helped writers before it helped people that are you know, using their hands to craft and create something visual uh, artists uh, yes yeah um but it, it's just been very, very fulfilling just because, like I said, the my previous job, I was doing a lot of things that were very highly technical. And it's not to say that like I didn't enjoy that and I didn't see their passion for it because it was obviously important. Mm-hmm. But it was one of those things where it didn't light me up. And yeah. I, I really wanted to lean into something that very much lit me up and and working with people that are artists that use a lot of their creativity to make something that I couldn't even imagine put together. And uh, I just love it so much. Awesome. So, um, okay. First of all, I have a comment about your website. So your URL is DR Harris and, or DR Harris consulting, correct? Mm -hmm. But every time I look at that, I see Dr. Harris. (laughs) (laughs) which after telling your story about how you thought you wanted to be a doctor that's even more perfect (laughs) and it really works because that's like those are my initials also Daniela Renee so that's awesome (laughs) it's just all full circle yeah so the big message on your homepage on your website it says that that really resonates with me it says grow your confidence and your community without feeling overwhelmed And really, that's what we're all trying to figure out, right? There's so much to know about marketing and so many things we're supposed to be doing all the time. It's so easy to get overwhelmed. So can you talk to us a bit about your approach to help creatives market their work without feeling overwhelmed all the freaking time? (laughs) <laughs> so first of all, I just want to say that the people that are further along than you, a lot of times have teams or outsource right. a lot of different things. Right. And so you 
often as you're first starting off are comparing your square one to someone else's square 55, yeah. which is not a fair comparison. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And so really when I tell people when they're first starting off is to focus on one thing. What is going to be your core area that you're going to work on? Do you want to write emails to people? Are you a writer and long form works the best for you? Send out emails. Mm -hmm. That's where you want to focus your time and attention. If you want to do Instagram type things, do Instagram. Don't focus on every single other platform. Eventually, you might get on those places, Mm -hmm. but to be very proficient in 50 different platforms is not it's not good. You're going to spin out. You're going to say like, oh, I should be doing here. I should be here. I should be there. Focus on one thing at a time. Get very proficient at that. And once you feel like you have a process and system in place for getting that done effectively, then you can move on to something else. And to be honest, that will take time. You have to try to figure out and experiment what is going to work best for you. Um, A lot of times people are just like, okay, I don't know how often to pose or how often to send out things. Mm -hmm. Try it out. What what feels sustainable to you? Because what you're what's going to work is what you can do repeatedly on an ongoing basis. And Mm -hmm. so if doing something every single day, seven days a week, posting five times a day is not going to be sustainable for you, then don't do it. And don't try to stress (laughs) out about doing that, because what's going to happen is that you're going to feel guilty about not doing it. And then when you feel guilty, you'll end up not doing it more. And then time (laughs) will go away and you just realize, oh, it's been it's been two months and I haven't done any marketing marketing activities. Not doing it more is my specialty. (laughs) (laughs) I think that um, what you're speaking to is consistency too. And consistency is, is I think important in marketing, but it can be very difficult to, to find, you know, what is right for you. Um, And if it looks like, oh, I have to post every single day to Instagram, you know, a brand new piece of artwork or a brand new something um, that feels super overwhelming. And consistency is not the same as frequency either. So, you know, you have to remember that when you're starting off, starting is the most important portion of that. And then getting into that habit. Mm -hmm. And then once you start to build up that, you're like, oh, okay, maybe I can do more because I figured out something and you can amp it up. But all of this takes time. And to be under the impression that anything's going to happen overnight is just false. I... I'm a definite believer of the fact that marketing, good marketing just takes time and to put in the work and the foundation, it's, it's going to be a slow start. You can start off fast and furious if you want to, Mm -hmm. um, but is that going to be sustainable for you? Yeah, Then you're going to burn out just as quickly. Exactly. So I, I'm more of a proponent of, you know, starting at a pace that you can maintain and if you can ramp up good and if you need to downgrade for whatever reason life Mm -hmm. um, then you can do that too but trying to figure out what's going to be a balance of something that you can really maintain like on your worst day what can you do and then you can figure out what you can do on your best day but like if you can optimize Mm -hmm. for what your worst day is going to look like right then that's going to be that's going to be the key that's awesome advice yeah. And there's so many different platforms, like you you were saying, is trying to focus on one. You know, there's there's Instagram and Pinterest and email marketing and Facebook and paid advertising like Google ads or Facebook and Instagram ads. There's so many different things you could focus on. And when it comes to like paid ads, a lot of people when they're starting out, is it important to focus on organic growth first or like at what point do you go, oh, I should do paid advertising? I personally believe to get a practice of organic first, Mm -hmm. just because it's going to be really good for you to get your rhythm and find your voice. And so once you have your voice aspect finalized of who you're speaking to, how you say different things, then you can then experiment on how to message that on a, a paid scale. But I personally like to get more of a grounding and foundation organically first Mm -hmm. and then move on to uh to the paid aspect of it just because you know organic's always going to be a really good powerful tool for you to use Mm -hmm. and you can scale up and down for for paid however whenever you want to that's not to say like don't start off right away if you want to like i said i believe in experimenting so if you want to experiment and go down that route fine but i just personally believe that having a good organic foundation mm-hmm. is going to be really good in solidifying some additional skills as far as knowing how to talk to the people that you really want to talk to what language really resonates with them without having to pay for it yeah that makes sense 
Yeah, I know the very basics of marketing is sort of to start by identifying your ideal customer avatar, right? Like the ICA or Mm -hmm. basically your, your ideal customer. But a lot of us as artists have multiple ideal customer avatars. So for example, I teach classes for other artists, but I also want art directors to see my own illustrations and artwork to license for products. So um, one of the confusing things is as I'm starting out is trying to market to two distinct audiences through like a single website or a brand. That's very confusing to me on how to do that successfully. I think you have to just be very clear about what you do and very clearly segment, um, especially mm-hmm. going back to my days when I was working in the the concrete industry. I want to say that there are like seven different groups of people that this one organization all talked to. Wow. And it was getting very clear about who are these different types of people that you wanted to talk to. And really, it just came down to like knowing what language they speak and knowing where they're at. Because one tactic in one area um, is not necessarily going to work for another group of people in another area, which then you're saying like, oh, well, that kind of goes counter to what you were saying to focus on one area. Mm -hmm. But where are most of your people going to be at? Is there an overlap in any of those places? So do all, you know, say you have three different groups of people that you're trying to talk to. Uh Is there an overlap in where those people are at? And how can you talk to them in a way that clearly conveys, here are the three areas of things that I do and that I focus on. And some of it might be very forward facing that you do. And other things might be back end facing where it's one-to-one contact, old school Mm -hmm. networking uh, type aspects of it. And some of it is more Instagram-y, Pinterest-y type things that you do. Um, But just really being very clear about where those people live and lay out. And that's all a part of like what I like to do is for like four steps of marketing of, you know, being very clear about the research of it, Mm -hmm. knowing where the people are at, like you said, the client or the avatars, what are some events or, you know, networking hubs of where these people that you want to reach out to work at, Mm -hmm. um, then building up your awareness in these different areas, then building relationships with these people. So you can ultimately get to your sales and sell your classes or your course or whatever it is that you're, you're selling. Yeah. And I think, I think that's good advice. I think, um, there's a lot of people on Instagram. There are definitely art directors looking on Instagram. And then there's also people who are potential students looking on Instagram, but there are ways to reach out directly. You're pitching your portfolio to art directors. You're developing relationships with people outside of that for a very specific goal. Um, But it is sometimes hard to have like a website and be catering to those two things and making sure that you're like when somebody lands on your page, it makes sense to them. (laughs) Yeah. And honestly, I yeah, I I think that just starting off and saying like, here is what I do for this person, like being very like blunt and clear, like here's here's my page. Here is my face at the top. Mm -hmm. And then if you are an art director here, if you are a student here, if you're whatever else demographic here. And here are the three ways that I can help you. If you have more than that, a lot of times it can just get very confusing and then people don't know. Um, So I try to want to say to pare it down. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's not like, oh yeah, I've helped like 50 million types of people. (laughs) Because if you're trying to help everyone, then it looks like you don't help anyone yeah, for very sure. well. So just be very, very curated. Like here are the three types of people that I can help in a distinct way and the steps to to follow if you want to work with me. Yeah, that makes sense. I personally, I go back and forth on whether or not mine should be one website slash brand or two, because I have, um, I, make and sell my own art and products with my art on it. And that's one thing. And then I also do websites for artists. And while, um, while some artists might also buy my work, which is fantastic. The people who are just interested in the work don't care at all that I also build websites. So it's like, do you have any thoughts about, about that? Like if your audiences really are truly very different, having, and managing two separate brands or or do you prefer what you just mentioned which is having your own website and then you just point the people in the different directions well here's the thing that's not going to be an answer that you might necessarily like 
there is no one right way. Right. You can do it however yeah. you want. Any any way works. And I've done it both ways and I've gone back and forth on it and and I, you know, I haven't really decided what's best for me. <laughs> and I, I think it just really depends. So if you are marketing yourself as like say a personal brand, like you yourself are the face of it, mm-hmm. then I think you can do a lot of different things. Okay. If you were trying to work under the name of say a, a particular named business, mm-hmm. then you know maybe splitting it up might might work. But all that to say, you can do however you want. That yeah. goes back to what I really love experimenting of what works for one person might not work for yeah. another and what works for you know, and vice versa, what works for everyone else might not work for you. I say experiment it out. Um, but if you are working under, like I said, generally, if it's your name, your mm-hmm. face, that is the forward facing part. I think that you can, quote, get away with a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, like have, a, have an umbrella brand, basically. Right. Yeah. Um, but if you were saying like, oh, no, this is Acme Company. Right. And, you know, we do this and this other name company portion does this other thing then that might make a little bit more sense but all that to say experiment see what makes the most sense um, but also remember that that's an additional thing that you're going to have to build up a name brand recognition around right. so then you're setting yourself up to needing to do all right well do i need a presence for each and every one of these separate brands that we're going to do and then that gets into the overwhelm and then it gets into like okay well now i have to do one message chain thing for here and another thing for over here yeah and that can just really blow up on you yeah it sounds overcomplicated. <laughs> start, start small i said yeah. well especially when it's just you like you mentioned before how you know some of these people that we look to that have amazing brands have a whole team of people. And when mm-hmm. you're just starting out, it's you. You're wearing all the hats. You don't have a team of people. You don't necessarily have a virtual assistant to help you. So it it takes a lot of time. And if you're trying to do two brands instead of one, that can feel very overwhelming. And we want to eliminate the overwhelm as much as possible because <laughs> there, there's so many things that are already overwhelming of, okay, is this is what my day job is mm-hmm. going to work is the art that I'm creating is that working out and then on top of that you have to do whatever bookkeeping and the marketing and all the other stuff what are some ways that you can simplify that process as much as possible by just focusing on one thing if you've got one umbrella brand and you have three core messages or however many that you want to end up having and going from there and if you want to grow and expand and do all the things later I say go for it, but I I like to start off smaller, simpler, and then build some momentum to then expand. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, so I have a question for you. Yes. Can we do like a little exercise? So say I'm, I'm an artist coming to you saying I need help with my marketing. I've been making a lot of art, but I've been afraid to put it out there. I'm just going to like make up an example and see what you might suggest. So um, I started an Instagram and I maybe have posted a couple things on the feed and I feel like I have to do all the things. So I'm trying to start an email list and I also set up Pinterest and Facebook and Twitter and I just I'm paralyzed. I just have art that I want to share. I don't know exactly where I'm going to go with it, but I, I know I need to get it out there because I want people to to buy my products or to license my designs for other products. Where do I even start? Because I'm so overwhelmed by all the options. That's a great scenario. Because yeah. that is where so many people <laughs> that, I mean, that's, end up that's starting a lot, off. That's a lot of our listeners are in that exact spot. My first question would be, who is your art for? Well, it's for everybody. I just want (laughs) to share all my pretty stuff with everybody. How do I know who it's for? I'm throwing all the hard questions at you. If you had a picture of the person that was coming up to say you were at a booth that was buying your art, what do they look like? What do they do? What's what's their story? What is that one person? And you're just like, ooh, this person, I know that they I spot them out. I know that they would love my art. Mm hmm. Who are they? Give me a description of them. Would they be on Pinterest? Would they be on whatever? And I'm starting at who you're trying to really attract. 
from from that person because once you get there then you can figure out all the rest of the stuff because it it comes down to the fact that you need to understand who exactly you're trying to sell to and be in front of the right people and that so that's a it's a mental exercise it's going to be on you at first to be like oh yes it's for everyone but like also like toothpaste is for everyone but also <laughs> there's organic toothpaste right. but that, like that that's like not for everyone like there there's right. still you know you're to an extent niching down but like not not fully to that extent but like there there's a vision of an ideal person because there might be the person that's like i don't want to pay a whole lot of money for uh whatever but i still want to experience nice things is that who they are or are you charging ten thousand dollars for your art and so that's a different type of person just being very clear and specific on what that is is it for the the everyday general consumer of things or is it for like the highly specific they have like a very keen eye for something that no you can uniquely provide for them like getting very clear on that aspect of it because what you might do uh for something that's just like oh yeah like it's a little it's a it's a trinket it's a little thing that you put on your desk how you go and approach that to you know massive prints that you want to sell and in corporate spaces that would be a completely different thing it's yeah like, right. everything's not for everyone it's, so yeah. getting clear on that at the very beginning is so important and i think it's it, it's interesting what you're kind of defining is where do you want your artwork as well to be? So like what products, is it fine art that's going to be hung inside of a corporate building? Or is it that you want your patterns to be printed on children's clothes, right? Like if you have sort of an idea of where your art best fits, then you can start catering your advertising and your feed and the work that you put out in the world to sort of cater to that audience. Exactly. Yeah, because a lot of people may like they may not have sold anything at all yet. You know, they've been making art. They've been taking classes. They're finally feeling like it's time to put it out there. But like I can look at the people who've bought my art and say, you look a lot like this audience. But if you haven't made any sales, then I think the way you put it, the questions to ask are the perfect questions to try to get you know, I haven't sold it, but here's where I picture my art. So who are the people who would be seeing it in that location? So I think that's a good Mm -hmm. way to approach it. Yeah. I I think if you start there, then you'll start to pare down. And if you are on all the platforms, cool. Cause now you reserve (laughs) those domain names. Don't, don't necessarily feel like you have to post everything on every single thing. If you feel like it, then cool. And if that's where you're your initial research and when i say research i'm not talking about like miles and miles of pages and pages of like this academic type style i'm talking about like going on facebook groups or mm-hmm. no just looking around on on instagram or wherever else and saying like oh okay yeah I, yeah these these people feel like the type of people like i might want to sell to and picking up on things from there it's like okay yep that that looks right that sounds right okay maybe based off of the comments that they are saying or the the vibes that are going on here, that might be where I want to go and pare down. But if you're on 50 million things, honestly, I'm tired for you. <laughs> the content that you're putting out there. Let me ask you a specific question about the 50 million things. So this is what I do. And you can tell me if it sounds like it makes sense or not. I went ahead and reserved my name on all the platforms. And I think that's a great thing to do, whether you're planning on using them all now or not, because you want to make sure when you're ready that you have the name. I have mine. It's Nikki May Art across all the platforms. But I focus on Instagram. That's where I spend most of my time. But since I have the other platforms and I can set it up to do it automatically, I automatically have it post two other ones. So I'm spending my time on Instagram, but, and especially for the podcast, we spend our time more on, um, on Instagram and Facebook, but since it's really easy to just use a tool like later to automatically post it to all of them, I figure it can't hurt to just have a presence there, even if that's not where I'm focusing. So I'm, I'm spending my, my energy on Instagram, but just automatically posting it everywhere. Does that make sense? Or is that a waste of time? Do you have any thoughts about that? No, it's working smarter, not harder. Yeah. Especially if you're still mostly focusing and directing people into one location. Mm -hmm. So 
be that your Instagram page, mm-hmm. then you don't necessarily have dormant pages in other areas. If right. people might happen to to tag you in something else and you're like, oh, OK, yep, they, they do have a Facebook page. Mm-hmm. They seem to be more active or comment more on this other spot, but it's not blank and bare. And if it is blank and bare, like that's fine because my Twitter is essentially just a Twitter handle with maybe one random tweet, but I have it reserved yeah. should mm-hmm. I care to and want to do it. But that's absolutely a, a great way to go about that cross um, promoting in, in all the different platforms. I just say, make sure that you're using best practices because one of the things I absolutely hate is when people post for Facebook primarily and they have a link and they're caption but it automatically goes to instagram and then there's like this link that's in the instagram caption that you can't click on that drives me crazy right that's so much it's like you can't (laughs) click on it so like why are you putting this googly clap of a link in this area that i can't even click on and do anything Mm with? so i would just say like make sure that when you are doing post in that type of fashion that you're you know, editing it a little bit to make sure that right. you're taking into consideration the best practices on the different platforms. But yes, I'm all for working smarter and not harder. Awesome. Yeah. Cause I figure if somebody accidentally finds me on one of the platforms that I'm not super active on, it's just, you know, an extra nice accidental find. An added bonus. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. No, I say cool. that's an absolute great way to go about doing things, uh, but just making sure that you're not spinning out about that, especially if you're just like, I'm primarily focusing on this one platform mm-hmm. um, and not necessarily thinking like, OK, and now I have to recreate right. specific new brand new content on a platform that you're not yeah. initially focused on, because if you if you are intentionally focused on a different one, you might want to change it up a little bit and have some custom. But if that's not where you're going, which if you're starting off is absolutely what I'm suggesting, not focusing on every single one, right. then cross promoting like that across diff- the different platforms is an absolute great way to go. Awesome. Thanks. I think that a lot of artists are pretty focused on Instagram because it is a very visual platform. And mm-hmm. part of the challenges that have happened in recent months is that there's a big shift to video, right? And a lot of us are very scared of video. <laughs> And doing that because, you know, we love making beautiful still images and then having this. It's sort of like the algorithm pushes you towards if you're not putting video out there, then I'm going to show it to like 10 percent of the people that would normally have seen it in your feed. Um, So do you have any recommendations for people on that on that platform at all and how, you know, how to kind of push through that? So definitely get on video. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> step so, one accept that you have to just get on video <laughs> but but here's the thing there are several different ways that you can go about doing that so yes you can show your face on there if that's what you like and enjoy doing mm-hmm. if you want to dance doing the reels and other oh, gosh, things no. you can <laughs> nope. abso- you can nope, absolutely nope, nope. do that <laughs> But another thing that you can definitely do is you could do voiceover type stuff and then you can do what, of course, I'm sure you've seen a lot of people do the behind the scenes of how you go about making right. whatever it is that you make. Right. Um, and then maybe a, an audio description of just voiceover. Of, yeah. So maybe it's just your hands that we see, the actual creation process, if you're sewing something, if you're painting something, uh-huh. if you're writing something, you know, go about doing that and Maybe it's just a description of and a nice calming ASMR type voice of and this is how I go about doing this. <laughs> and I did that and I put the, the colors together and I swirled them together. Now, however you want to go about, about doing that, but you don't necessarily have to um, to show your face if that's not something that you're comfortable with. I personally yeah. say, though, like people like to connect with a person behind mm-hmm. everything. Right. Um, but if that's not where you're at right now, I say that that's completely fine. But let us know your personality through some type of way so if you if you have a comedic twist to you then do some voiceover and show us how how funny you are at it's in your process or if you make mistakes about something go and show us your mistakes because people like to see that everyone is human and like oh yeah i totally screwed up over here but i here's how i covered it up or Mm -hmm. no this is how i edit it whatever type of thing but honestly you're going to have to be on video some type of way. <laughs> How, however you go about that, there it could be something where you're on a meditative walk. Maybe that's part of your process before you you get to creating, you go outside for a walk. Yeah. So maybe you just show 
you know, the walk that you take. Your ritual, whatever your think. ritual is. And or yeah. Yes. How, however you go about doing that, maybe that's the video content that you post, but you should be doing some video. And the good thing is, it's not like YouTube length where it has to be like 20 minutes of you talking about something. Right. 30 seconds is completely fine. Yeah. I mean, that's all that anybody has the attention span for anyway. <laughs> like, <laughs> Definitely. Better for worse. <laughs> Definitely. It's like 30 seconds. But um, yeah, I like that. Um, idea where, you know, having your face is good, but there are other options and you can still have things like you're talking about is like your preparation process that can, that's still part of your brand, right? Like showing how you create your artwork and what goes into the intention behind it. People could be really interested in that aspect as well. Oh yeah. People just love how people set up their space. Honestly, if you're just like, here's, here's how I prep this one little area before Mm -hmm. I even get started. Yeah do that oh yeah i made a reel of i did a time lapse video of me cleaning up and organizing my desk in my studio and i got more interaction on on that (laughs) reel than almost anything and it's just a time lapse of me cleaning up yeah people are so interested in uh, the behind the scenes of how things get made how whatever it is it could be Mm -hmm. like how how i make up a marketing plan people like to say like oh what tools what process what this what that like Tell people, show people that. (laughs) Well, speaking of that, Danielle, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? (laughs) And you know what? I'm super simple when it comes to things like that. I I use Canva. I think everyone uses Canva. Mm -hmm. I'm not an artist. I that is not my gift, at least in that way. So I very much make use of the Canva Pro. Mm -hmm. I use later to schedule post things although i do a lot of organic just posting directly in Mm -hmm. the feed also and then i also use Airtable, so i use that as a tool to organize and what i call an idea bank so there will be times where i have this brilliant idea for something i will dump it into my idea bank and so when it comes to the time period where I set aside to actually create content, I am not coming to the content creation process with nothing. I have a bank of maybe like 20 or so ideas and I can go and sift through that. It's like, oh, OK, here's an idea that was just really just like an idea and other things. I have like more depth to them. Like I mm-hmm. see it like fully fleshed out in my head. And so I have it like outlined so yeah. I decide like, oh, OK, do I want to flesh out this one idea or do I want to really clean up this idea that I already kind of had polished? So, yeah, I use Airtable to get all of that organized. And between those couple of things, that's really what I use at this point. I don't think you have to have anything super complicated. I also don't think you have to pay for a whole lot of things. Later has a free version um, yeah. of their platform. Canva has a free version of their platform. Airtable is completely free. Mm hmm. You don't have to pay for a whole bunch of stuff. And the free versions offer quite a lot. Oh, really. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When you're getting started, it's great. No, if, if you want to, if you want to spend money, you can always spend money. But I'm, I'm not going to be an advocate of saying like, oh, you absolutely have to pay for this. If there's anything you want to pay for, like I'll definitely pay for the Canva Pro just so I can like resize all the different uh, graphic images. But other than that, I, I'm not a, a big fan of saying like, oh, yeah, you absolutely have to pay for it every single little thing because you don't because then your expenses add up really quickly and then you get to resent like i pay so much money for this i'm not even using it blah 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 yeah i don't like that yeah i actually love canva pro as well i just recently joined and there's just cool animations and cool like all kinds of cool stuff that it can do good stock photography that's in there as well stock video yeah so danielle do you um do you create a, a a marketing calendar and plan in advance uh, specific campaigns and like how often you, what you're going to post when and do you do that kind of thing for your clients? So when I work with my clients, I usually help them out with setting up very foundational things of who they're talking to, how they're going to talk about that and revolve it around there. And then working backwards, if there is a particular campaign, so say they're launching access to a course, Mm -hmm. then we'll work on coming up with very specific content around that. Then outside of that, coming up with here are some general themes that you'll be working towards. So say if there's a month that's very particular to your to your field of work, um, say it's you know, the summertime and, you know, your ice cream shop, then, you know, you might have a little bit something different than if it's wintertime. But 
typically what I work on personally is what's going to be my priorities of the big things that I'm launching. So if I'm launching or working on my one-on-one consulting, then I'm talking about how are the different ways that this is helpful for other people. So if you are in the process of preparing for maybe it's a show that's coming up, then maybe you're creating content around the fact like, here's how I prep for this process and the themes of the pieces that I'm creating for mm-hmm. this. So that might be the the general overall theme of that. Um, but it's really about like what what are going to be your priorities kind of for the year that you're setting up mm-hmm. and then working around that because there should be some general themes about what you talk about because it could be about yourself helping people and audiences know more about you as an individual knowing about the style why you have that particular style in your work that you do um, and then other things that just are kind of like adjacent to it so you kind of feel like a more well-rounded person mm-hmm. uh, especially <laughs> if you're an individual brand as opposed to like no but like this is just this is just the the art or the business or whatever it is people like to think that they know a little bit of insider knowledge about you it's like oh yeah they t- they always drink tea in the morning before they go and get to creating like knowing a little bit of that aspect in my case they always drink bourbon not in the morning <laughs> not in the morning <laughs> you have coffee too i do i do i have it right here next to me i drink coffee until it's time to switch to bourbon <laughs> perfect which is why i'm chronically dehydrated <laughs> but yeah but that's that's kind of my thought my thoughts behind content calendars they you know you can generally theme them but i i like to have like a little pool of topics that i can pull from at any time and then transition to specific things if there's um you know a launch or a particular event that i'm working towards yeah that makes perfect sense yeah the cool thing about Airtable is that Airtable is not only um, available for your desktop, which is where I normally kind of use Airtable, but it also has an app. So you were talking about that idea thing. And sometimes your greatest ideas happen in odd moments, like when you're out and about or you're taking a walk or something like that. In the bathtub. (laughs) You can go into the (laughs) app and plug that in, right? And keep your little ideas list. So I like that. Mm Mm-hmm. So I want to switch a little bit and and talk about um, the first week of December. You offered a free biz planning co-working session, which I thought was a fantastic, generous thing to do. I signed up for it and then sadly couldn't make it because I had to, had something else I had to do at that time. But um, first of all, I think that's a great marketing thing because what you did there basically is you generously offered something free to anyone who was interested but then it gave them a free taste of what it's like to work with you. So can you talk a bit about that and why you offered it and how it went? Yeah, absolutely. I am a big planner. I love to plan things out. I don't like to be surprised. I also like to procrastinate. So if I plan things out, then I know exactly when to procrastinate. (laughs) So that's, ooh, (laughs) teach me that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's kind of the impetus, uh, you know, around, around that. But when I decided to set this up, I knew that a lot of people get overwhelmed at the end of the year, the start of the year of what am I focusing on? What should I be doing? And so I wanted to offer a space for people could be together and trying to figure out what is my move, what's the next thing Mm -hmm. for the new year. And so I put together a a few prompt questions for people to kind of get them thinking of like, okay, well, what went well? What didn't go well for the year, uh, you know, in 2021? And then going forward, how do you want to feel about the year? And having this event in general did a couple of things. One was to help create a community around people that wanted to, you know, move forward in their business. Mm -hmm. But not only that, it also offered me an opportunity to talk with people that I may or may not have actually worked with before. So I had people that came into the space. You know, a lot of the people I had known, they had been part of the active group of people that I've been talking with for a while. Mm -hmm. There were also a couple of people that I didn't really know or didn't really realize like were interacting or had been like Mm -hmm. seeing things of mine before, but never... never interacted in any meaningful way before. And it was an opportunity for them to join. So because I offered this up, I then had access to their email addresses, which, you know, always a good thing to collect. Even if you aren't focusing on email marketing, collecting up emails is going to be great. 
it was a great way for me to then create a relationship. So afterwards I can say like, oh, hey, thank you for showing up to this. Here's some other things that you might want to think about when planning, or here's another way that you might want to work with me specifically. And I thought it was just a really good way to offer something that's of value to people, but also a meaningful way to continue a relationship or deepen a relationship that I want to have with people that may be interested in my services. Yeah, that's great. And I I love that concept, like Nikki was saying, is of, of getting a taster, you know, of the different services and also, you know, getting to know your personality and seeing if that's a good fit for their needs. Um, and when it comes to like the art world, a lot of times I think we do want to focus on email marketing at some stage. Maybe that's not the very, very first thing that people do, but I know how important that can be for conversions later and to be able to sell your artwork. Um, so as people are, are doing that, the freebie thing is, is also useful for that. Like having awesome freebies. Well, I would say don't call it a freebie because okay. you want to make sure that you're putting a value on it. Oh, that's, that's so, interesting. Okay. So that's, even if they don't have to pay for it, mm-hmm. uh, they, sh- they are exchanging something. So hopefully it's information about them. So you tell me a bit about me and I give you something of value that you can have. Mm-hmm. So maybe reframing it in a way where it's just like a value exchange. I love that. Mm-hmm. I love that. It, yeah. It's a way of trading, trading something of value rather than giving away a freebie. I like that way of thinking. Yeah. But it, it can still be something that's a very valuable, um, I just want to make sure that people understand that it's something that's just like, oh, yeah, it's a checklist. But is it a checklist that it's really helping people to move from point A to point B mm-hmm. in whatever journey it is that they they want to have? Um, like it's, it's free for them to access, but you still they got something and you're getting something in return. Nice. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so some people, when they're getting started, are really confused about what can they put in an email newsletter? Like how, how should they be nurturing this, this community that they're, they're trying to build? There are a couple of different ways to do that. I know that there are several people that like to do exclusive things, things that are not on any other platform that is exclusive to email. Mm-hmm. That's one way to go about doing things. Mm-hmm. It could be like a behind the scenes day in the life, or it could be, oh, did you see this post that I had? Well, here's the real lowdown story about what happened here. Um, it could be an exclusive aspect for a sales vehicle where you use it as early access, early bird access for things. But Mm -hmm. as far as the nurturing process, I think it's really just going to be along the lines of how you want to interact with the people. How much of yourself do you want to give? Yeah. It's a long form medium email somewhat ish. Yeah, it can be. (laughs) And I, I, I think it just really needs to be something that you feel comfortable giving additional exposure to, whether it's a a lesson that you've learned during a process Mm -hmm. or if it's something that's going to be coming up. I do feel like it should be something a bit more exclusive than any of your other posts. That's just me. That's what I like. I like to feel as if I allowed you to come into my inbox. I don't like signing up for emails like I'm a I'm a marketing person but I still don't like signing up for every single person's email right that well, comes out here so if I'm if I'm getting your email like I want to feel as if that I'm getting something that I couldn't get from your social media yeah if you can see else. it on Instagram what's the point of cluttering up your inbox with just the same thing you've already seen I think it should be it should be a bit deeper uh-huh. than that or something that's more personal or some other lesson that you're not exactly sharing. And it could be something where you have, you know, there's a lot of concepts of like, maybe you come up with your email first, and then Mm -hmm. you take a bit of the content from your email and you turn it into a post or something else. But the email is really like the meat and potatoes part Mm -hmm. of the content that you have. And the other things can be supplementary. You can think about it in other ways too. You can have like, oh no, like Instagram's the primary. And then, you know, I give some other things on the email list, but I, that's what I personally like. I like to okay. feel like email is like more exclusive and like it's an yeah. insider's club. So I have a couple of questions on that on email. Number one is recommended frequency. And number two would be when you, you mentioned format, long format, like when is long too long? Because people don't have that huge attention span like we mentioned. So I, I'm kind of confused sometimes in email. Where do I draw the line? I think that's 
very personal to you, like your form, how you Mm -hmm. design things. I know that there are some people that have longer emails, but people just devour them. They love it. They like the personality and the vibe of it. Uh, I tend to make mine on the shorter side, but that's because I just like brevity in general. I was the kid in school that they were always just like, write longer, write more. (laughs) that, That was never that was never my strong suit. But if you're a writer and you just like love going on Make sure it's engaging and interesting, but like mm-hmm. also don't make like don't make it a novel. But as far as frequency, I say a frequency that you can keep up with. So if you are brand new and this isn't anything that you've ever done before, you can start off with once a month and mm-hmm. have it known that every first Tuesday of the month, I send this out. That could be your regularity. It could be like every other week. Again, consistency is more important than frequency. Yes, all the time. Yeah. Get on a schedule. And once you feel like, okay, this is something that I can keep up with, then you can do it more if that feels like, you know, I really want to interact more. Yeah. Or if you're just like, no, I I can do once a quarter. <laughs> I, I, I mean, and if, if, and if you're still, if you're honestly just trying to start off, that is completely fine. It's more about building up the practice of yeah. doing it. Yeah. And it could take you a year and a half before you're just like, okay, no, I'm really in a stride of of doing this. I, I would just say come up with something that you are actually realistically going yeah. to do on a regular basis. And then once you get there, of course, there'll be people like saying like, oh, yeah, I send out, you know, two emails a week. If you can do that. <laughs> More power to you. <laughs> that feels good to you. Do it. But if you're just like, I, I really need to build up this practice. Like, yeah, I don't. I was just starting off and doing good on posting to Instagram on a regular basis. Now you want me to also do this as well. Like start off slow. Don't be afraid of saying like, oh, but no, there are other people that send out something that's weekly. Everyone starts somewhere. Yeah. Some people just really love and enjoy the writing process and the email creation process. Other people don't. Yeah. Build up your practice, whatever makes the most sense for you. I personally do monthly or at least attempt to do monthly. I like monthly. I have a lot of um, I have a lot of pictures on my emails. And I've also heard that's not always good to have lots of pictures because I guess other people's servers can can boot them out or put them in junk mail or something. I don't know. Yeah, it it depends. Uh, They're like if you get in. What was it? Outlook? Yeah, Outlook is the Microsoft one. There's some times where it doesn't initially show those up and it has to especially like download them. Mm-hmm. It's a mix. I think. It goes back to experimenting and seeing what the deliverability is on those different emails. A lot of the different platforms, they will have what their best practices are for that. I tend to not have that many. Mm -hmm. I I do a mix. I do a mix where some are like it's just a letter ish format. Yeah. And there are some where I've got like embedded a couple of my Instagram uh, feed things that link back to my Instagram page. It's a mixture of the two. I think you just have to figure out what a lot of this is going to be like, not very specific, but also very specific of figure out what works best for you and your vibe. Mm -hmm. But you can you can do pictures. I wouldn't go overly saturated with them because that could then be a lot. But making sure that it's in a format that is readable for everything, obviously. Um, And then making sure that, again, you can do it on a consistent basis that makes the most sense. But as far as having pictures, I say throw a few in and look at your results as far as your stats go. Are people opening it up, looking at it? Is it delivering well? And do you recommend for beginners a certain platform to use for email? I would say don't get bogged down on which platform. Choose a platform whatever platform i use mailer light specifically there are other people that use other platforms especially if you're still first starting off mm-hmm. find a free one yeah yeah don't, i don't, use mailchimp don't pay i use mailchimp and i have a free program with them that works really well yeah don't don't pay um unless you really have a huge database but if you have a huge database you probably aren't uh brand new to this but right. you can ask a couple of people that you really trust that are doing something mm-hmm. but you're going to spend too much time trying to research and find the right platform as opposed to like just getting started. That's my specialty. <laughs> <laughs> and in a lot of scenarios, especially when you're first starting out, you don't know what you like or don't like. So you need to just start someplace yeah. and go from there. And then you can figure out, OK, I like this or I don't like this, but you won't know specifically and for yourself 
unless you just start going at it. So you can get into the habit or the the rut of analysis paralysis. Like, oh, I've right. got these three different ones. And this one does this thing. And this other one does oh, this yeah. other thing. And then you might figure out like, oh, this thing that I really thought that I would like and use is actually not even a feature that I use at all. So right. I say just, just pick something. Just start. That's what we're all about is just getting started. That's our overall message. You know, just, just get started. So, okay, Danielle, tell us... This has all been super great advice, and I know that everybody listening is going to want to learn how they can work with you. So I know you have a one-on-one consulting program called The Blueprint. Can you tell us a bit about that, and is that the best way to work with you? That is absolutely the best way to work with me. The Blueprint is just that. It is a a program where we give you the foundations of exactly how to get started in your marketing. The main things that I like to focus on is what I call the foundations. And so it's really getting a clear understanding of who you are as a person, Mm -hmm. the values of your business, and getting a really clear understanding of the people that you want to serve. And so one of the first things that I start off with is getting people to really do, um, a deep dive of like the questions that we asked before is like, who do you see purchasing, consuming your art and getting very clear on that. Mm -hmm. And once we're clear on that, and then once we're clear on who you are and what you value, then we build out a plan surrounded by that. You can't not, in my opinion, build something as far as a marketing plan that really connects with people without getting those things right. So you can start off by doing all these other things of getting logos together and getting, you know, nice graphics of of every other thing. But if you don't understand who your people are that you're trying to reach, you probably might end up creating a logo or some type of plan that doesn't actually even resonate with who you're trying to attract. Yeah. So I like to start off with the, the foundations with getting a good blueprint plan in Mm -hmm. place and then going from there. And so that's something that I offer. It's a three month process and we meet on uh, a regular basis of getting those aspects together where we understand who you are, who you're trying to connect with and how we can make sure that your voice is actually heard and it's doing it in an organic, sustainable, non-stressful way. Awesome. So One of the questions we'd like to ask all of our guests is what is one piece of advice that you could give an artist or designer who is just getting started? Specifically to artists just getting started, wanting to do anything in marketing, I would say don't be afraid of the fact that you may or may not have business, quote unquote, business experience. I think there are a lot of people that are just like, that wasn't ever anything that I studied before or knew about before. Totally. I'm just new to this. I don't, I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Honestly, that can be an advantage. There are so many people out there that have been very well trained in a lot of areas mm-hmm. and having an outside perspective is really good. So making sure that you're trusting your own instincts about things. Absolutely get advice from other things, but realize that you have a vision and trust that vision that you have for yourself. Yeah. Just making sure that you're, you're really trusting your instincts and not being, you know, so intimidated by what else is out there and all the advice and what everyone else is doing. And like I said, comparing yourself to Mm -hmm. others. Trust your instinct is great advice. Um, Okay. Another question we like to ask, what's one resource that helped you a lot when you were just getting started? Software or a person to learn from? There is a website that I like to go to and refer to people if they are just really of the mindset of, I don't know what I'm doing. I want to learn a lot of things about marketing. It's called HubSpot. HubSpot has a very good marketing blog. Oh, yeah. So if you want to get templates for anything or learn about the latest practices or any type of research, I think that they are a really great resource to go to and and learn a lot about what's new, what's trending, how to go about doing different things and examples have tons of examples. Yeah, that's a great one. We'll definitely link to HubSpot. Now, is there anything that you wished we would have asked you that we didn't? Hmm. That's a good question. A mistake that I made in marketing. Ooh, Ooh yeah. yeah. Tell, that's a good one. <laughs> Tell us about a mistake you made and what you learned from it. So 
there are a couple of different things, but I, I, will, <laughs> I will start with this. And I actually I talked about this recently online and it was the fact that I paid for a lot of things that I really didn't have any business paying for tying systems where I was like, oh, I don't I don't even have the people to make this system work. I was looking at a client management system and I was just like, I don't I don't even have that many clients that I need to go through <laughs> and manage this. Like, why why am I paying this money for that? Or, um, you know, hiring someone out for a thing. It was like there are people that are like, oh, I should have like email funnels. You just started off. You don't need email funnels. You need to just practice writing an email. Just <laughs> paying for things and investments that are like three, four steps advanced of where you're at. I say embrace the level and the space that you're in right now because there are so many lessons that you can take from that mm -hmm. as far as honing in on your voice, knowing what type of content people that like you most resonate with. But if you're trying to go in advance and skip steps, you're just going to end up going back and needing to relearn those lessons all over again. So save your money, <laughs> stay at whatever level that you are at, fully embrace that. If you're just like, I'm, I'm doing this by yourself, all by myself. Yes, you are. And you're learning what things that you do like and you don't like. So that later on, as you grow and expand, you know, like, oh, when I get a virtual assistant at some point when I'm actually ready. I want them to do X, Y, and Z thing because you've done the different aspects and you know, like, this is what I want to outsource to that. Yeah. Fully embrace the level that you're at and don't try to, to jump ahead to what you see people, like I said, 50 steps ahead of mm -hmm. you doing. Embrace where you're at right now. Yeah. You compare yourself against somebody who is super successful and you think, oh, they're doing all these things. I need to do those things. But you really don't. Yeah, they're successful because they're doing these things. Yeah, now yeah. they're successful because they got really good at the earlier steps and they learned how to scale the earlier lessons into these more advanced things. Right. But if you don't learn the early lessons first, then you can't properly scale up and you'll end up just having to go back and learn it anyway. And it's going to cost you more time and money. Right. Yeah. I think a lot of us are guilty of we see somebody doing it well and then they're selling the, you know, the perfect system for you. So you feel like you have to, well, I can get where they are if I buy the system that they're using. So I think, you know, that shiny object that someone's dangling in front of you that we're hoping can save us from having to figure it out ourselves, but really you have to figure it out yourself for your own business and your own way of working. Mm -hmm. Because what works for one person may not work for you. Work yeah. works for you may not work for someone right. else. I feel like I say that all the time, but it's absolutely true. It's so true. Anything can work. However you do things can work, but you have to figure out what works for you and what's going to yeah. be sustainable for, for you. Sure. And if you try to scale up without understanding what works and what doesn't work, you're going to have something that's going to be really messy and you're going to wish that you had something simpler and you could have yeah. just embraced starting being at the beginning. There is something very beautiful about starting and being at beginnings. It doesn't feel like it in the course of it because you see all these other people that are so much more advanced and you're just like, I want to get there. I want to be there. Mm -hmm. But yeah. unless you saw them starting from the very beginning, they were at where you were at. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, just, exactly. Just flow with that. So where can our listeners find you online, Danielle? You can find me on Instagram, my primary location at d.r.harrisconsulting. At my website, it's also Dr. Harris Consulting, where you can learn more about my one-on-one -on -one service that I have. And if you find my Facebook, I'm not going to share you my Facebook. <laughs> don't look at that. I've got a Twitter also. Don't don't look for that. It's out there. Don't look for it. Uh, but Instagram, that's that's where you can find me there and my website. And then also, um, I talked a little bit about my my planning guide for the year. You can find a link to download that specifically on my Instagram account too. We'll link to that too. For sure. Awesome. Danielle, thank you so much for being here with us. This has been, it's been fantastic. We've been needing to get more into marketing and you gave some great advice that I know everybody's going to find some value in. Uh, it was so fun talking to you guys. You guys are fun. <laughs> awesome. To learn more about Danielle and read today's Stardust Society show notes, go to stardustsocietycom slash Danielle Harris. 
And if you have any marketing tips that you'd like to share with us or ideas you want to bounce off other Stardusts, uh, join us in our Stardust Society Facebook group. If you've enjoyed today's episode, we'd love for you to leave us a five-star rating and review. Reviews help us reach more Stardusts like you and keep us inspired to continue creating new episodes. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.